This is a story of what it's like to meet the Crown Prince of Norway, or His Royal Highness Crown Prince Håkon. I was lucky enough to get an invite to an intimate breakfast at the Skalgam Estate. This is the official residence of the Crown Prince, the Princess, and the family. It sits just outside of Oslo, located in the municipality of Oska. It is a beautiful estate with a rich, rich history going all the way back to the Middle Ages. Then it was actually used as a church. The current King of Norway was actually born right there on the estate. Later, during World War II, the estate was occupied by, yep, you guessed it, the Germans. In fact, when the war was lost and the commanding officer of the estate was asked to leave, instead of doing that, he simply blew himself up with 50 kilos of TNT right there on the estate property. Things at Skalgum these days, yep, they're much, much quieter, with the royal family enjoying both the privacy and the security that the estate offers. Although it wasn't exactly a heavily fortified estate when I visited, like say, the White House in America. There was some security, of course, and there was checkpoints to enter, but like most things in Norway, it was all very subtle. So I was there to have a casual breakfast with other local business leaders in the startup community. The Crown Prince and the Crown Princess having previously expressed their interest in helping Norway find the next 50 years of prosperity after oil. Here they are discussing that briefly on CNN. I haven't really heard of many monarchies or royal families getting behind tech and innovation and new age thinking that's very millennial. Do you see it that way? It's really exciting to be part of that uh, change and that movement uh, because it, it's basically something that gives energy and it's very promising and it's fun. Why have you made that something that you're championing? Well, uh, as um, many countries, I guess, Norway is going through changes now um, and we need new ideas and we need to uh, foster a culture where we actually uh, support uh, those ideas and the people behind them so that hopefully we can make a lot of uh, new successes, uh, find new solutions to the challenges that are facing us in the years to come. And I think also if you're going to solve the world's biggest issues today like climate change, the global health issues, the sustainable development goals, I mean you really need technology and innovation. So I think that whole idea of innovation at this crucial time uh, for the world I think is incredibly important. Is it also because the country has realized that they can't really rely on oil forever? This is something for most countries in the world today and most companies in the world today so that's why I think we're seeing that a lot of talent that used to work in the oil industry now has to work in different sectors and to use that talent in different kind of ways. Helping Norway make this transition from crude to code will be the greatest challenge for the to be king. Still, that being the case, the monarchy in Norway is much more passive when it comes to driving the country, especially economic concerns. That's for the elected officials and the bureaucrats to squabble over. The monarchy is there to represent Norway and inspire the Norwegian people. They don't enrich themselves or tip the scales for their own benefit, much like we see in other monarchies in other countries across the world. So while this table was surrounded by many of Norway's up and coming businessmen and businesswomen, it wasn't to push her own agenda or gain a royal favor. No, no, no. It was meant to be a much more casual affair and it was really about joint problem solving, which by the way is very Norwegian. Still, I was nervous. As an American, I don't exactly have much experience with nobility. You could say that we've spent the last 200 years moving away from the concept altogether. So how is this going to work? Do we stand on a red carpet? Do I bow? Do I kiss the ring, get on one knee? Like how far does this royal stuff go? When we meet, is he gonna like take a sword and touch it to each shoulder? Maybe I should wear a sword. I mean, he is a Viking prince after all. I was really thankful to learn that I didn't have to worry about any of that. This was not a state visit from a foreign country kind of event. It was just breakfast, where the prince also happens to be. We arrived at the state and we were immediately given a glass of champagne. That can only help with the nerves. Our small group chatted in what I presume was one of the many rooms for entertaining guests, and we waited for the prince's arrival. You know, in Norway, things almost always start on time and Norwegians in general are very punctual people, but the crown prince was running late. 
and although I suppose if there's anyone in Norway that can be allowed to be late, it would be him. Soon enough though, he had arrived, he said his quick hellos, and he encouraged us all to head to the table. There he said, everyone grab a plate and head to the buffet. Yep, even at the royal house, it was still a serve yourself kind of thing. A nod to the humble and do it yourself attitude found all over Norway. I sat down to find a note card with my name on it, which I thought was a nice fancy touch. And like any good tourist, I took the card home with me as a souvenir. The breakfast was good, but like most meals in Norway, eh, nothing too exciting. The talks around the table, however, were, with everyone getting equal opportunity to share their thoughts. This is Norway after all, no one was allowed to dominate the conversation, as much as perhaps maybe I'd like to. As the breakfast wrapped up, I had the chance to talk to the Crown Prince Hakon for a few minutes one-on-one. -on -one. I noticed that when he shook my hand, he had on his wrist what can best be described as hippie bracelets. Coming from California, I was very familiar with these, although normally you would find them on, let's say, a surfer and not the Crown Prince of Norway. I later learned that like many Norwegians, the Crown Prince had attended Berkeley University in Northern California. This is perhaps our most hippie school in the entire country, so maybe that's where those bracelets came from. At the same time, it was so nice and humbling to see him wearing something other than what I perhaps expected, royal fancy jewelry. That might be more common with other monarchies around the world. In, in Norway, yeah, sure, it's good to be the next king. But as a Norwegian king, it's much less about showing excess wealth, and it's more about supporting the people of Norway. Before our conversation wrapped up, the crown princess, Metamadet, entered the dining room. Now, I've probably seen way too many Disney movies, and I was perhaps expecting too much. Maybe, say, her descending down a crystal staircase, or maybe being surrounded by small woodland creatures, but no. She was actually in a very kind of simple, I guess the best way to describe it is a jumpsuit. And much to my surprise, she had dirt all over her. Yes, the Princess of Norway was covered in dirt. But it seems that she'd actually been out there in the morning, tending to the garden. And while it's probably safe to assume she has many people helping her with such a large garden, it was a really nice and humbling experience to see that in Norway, even the princess doesn't mind rolling up the sleeves and putting in the work. After that, we wrapped up things and we made our way home to Oslo and left the estate. I remember leaving that day feeling a new understanding for the Norwegian way. I expected to be impressed with all the opulence of royal life, but instead, I discovered that Norwegian values of equality and modesty, well, they go all the way to the top. This was an excerpt from my book, Working with Norwegians. If you're doing business in Norway, you can find a link to purchase the book in the description. Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe for more unique insights into Norwegian work culture. Thanks for watching.